but uh, they're usually stationed out in the most remote areas. And so you can see there's a big pipeline that comes in and then it goes through, um, if you stand up for one second, I'll point at the picture and you'll get a better idea. So this is the gas turbine, right? The cold air comes in here, we introduce fuel, hot air goes back out there. We have our own line of um, pipeline gas compressors that we design and build um, that move the gas down the pipeline. So each station is depending on um, the geography, they're maybe 100 to 200 miles apart from each other. So um, they're moving a lot of volume, um, but not very much lift. Any mechanical engineers? No. no. Any, no. any engineers? I like it. Great. That, that, way, <laughs> that way I can tell you all the stories I want, and you guys are just not heads. <laughs> so let's do, let's do a quick intro. What, what is your background? Um, so we have our oil and gas um, industry. We talked a little bit about the gas pipeline. Um, we put our equipment on the offshore oil platforms a lot um, because not only are they um, uh, clean burning, but they're for the amount of size, they're quite powerful. And on an offshore oil platform, real estate is really va valuable. Now they're starting to move into deeper and deeper water to where um, there's no land that they can stick underneath the platform. So they're basically floating ships that are doing all the drilling or processing. And so weight is even more of a concern. For them. So um, they love our gas turbines. Gas turbines will either drive electric generators for power on board the ship, or um, they will either do gas pipeline, or they might even um, pump water. So in some of these real deep um, wells that they have, and they're trying to bring oil up, they inject high pressure seawater into those wells um, to bring, um, to, to increase the production of that. So you guys are all Channel Island environmental mm -hmm. engineers, right? Mm -hmm. So you guys see all those platforms offshore. Yep. Yeah. Where's all that tar coming from that's on the beaches? Seeps. Oil spills. Oil spills. Mostly seeps, right? Mm -hmm. We haven't talked about, we're, we're talking about oil next week. We have somebody from WISPA come ah, and talk about but, so. okay. well, but it's good, it's I'm good. I'm teeing it up for you. It's then. good, it's good, it's good. So, so the oil companies are under extreme amount of pressure and so is the, um, the shipping industries uh, to not have any oil spills at all. They get extreme yeah. fines, right? Yeah. Because now you can watch um, platforms, ships, and everything else from satellites. So if they see an oil sheen, and it doesn't take much oil to make an oil sheen, they can spot that from a satellite and boom, they find whoever's the operator or owner of that vessel. So our equipment has to be super clean. Uh, but because of our terrestrial um, component, the, the parts that we're putting into land, hey, we sell into a lot of areas high. like California. <laughs> California is super tight on Same emissions. Time. So we have, um, and you'll see out here on the shop floor, that we basically have um, two different kind of combustion systems. Our standard combustion, but then we have what we call our Solanox um, combustion system. And it's basically, now that with the advent of electronics and electronic controls, we can, we can control the firing temperature of the turbine mm. right down to, mm. from a chemistry standpoint, mm -hmm. there's an ideal temperature that air and natural gas will burn at. The closer you are in your combustion process to burning at that um, temperature, the cleaner you are. Then you, all you're doing is releasing CO2 and um, water. But if you, if you start moving off of that, the temperature starts climbing, now, what do you get? Heat. What kind of emissions? PHs, dirty, NOx. Dirty NOx. This is probably your teacher with you. He's going to give you all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so as the firing temperature goes up, right, NOx emissions go up. So the closer we can get to that ideal um, firing temperature, um, the better it is for emissions. But the worse it is for the stability of running an engine because you're right at that point where the flame wants to go out. It, either too much load or too, cool, too much cooling, now you lose that heat triangle and the flame goes out. So all the electronics very tightly control where that turbine is operating at. And so, um, so for the last, I would say, 20 years, we've been continually refining and reducing the amount of pollution that our gas turbines put out. And especially on natural gas, we're um, super clean burning. Now that gets you back to the maritime industry. Why, why my job and why am I trying to put um, these turbines onto ships? 
because um, as, as, you're, as Sean was saying, um, the current technology is that they take like the last product out of the refinery, they pump it on board the ship, they have to heat it up to almost boiling temperature just to get this product to move. It's like a tar. Um, and then they inject it into really slow moving two stroke in diesel engines. And so there's a lot of particulates and everything else that goes out. The International Maritime Organization is finally putting pressure on the on marine industry to reduce emissions. And at the same time, with all of the um, shale gas that we're finding in the United States, LNG is becoming more popular. Who knows what LNG is? Yeah, liquefied natural gas. So um, the, the nice thing about liquefied natu natural gas is that um, you're compressing, you're basically reducing the volume of gas 900 times, six to 900 times. But it's a super cold, it's at minus 264. Um, but now it becomes a liquid that can be a fuel on board um, anything that moves. And so now you have the um, ability to burn a super clean fuel offshore in a super clean technology. And so we're going after the cruise ship industries first you know, because their passengers, the people that are paying the ticket, um, directly can okay. see what's going she out the stack. Whereas like IKEA, they may have this um, super tight sustainability goal that when all their stuff goes into a container in China and they put it on the ship, once it leaves the port, nobody's watching what's going out the stack, right? So anyways, that's how we got to this point. That's how you guys got to this tour. <laughs> We're going to go out and take a look at some of the machinery that um, we built. here logistically but um, basically um, in addition to manufacturing our gas turbines you probably saw that the turbines sit on skids and um, a lot of our turbines get packaged up in an acoustic enclosure um, in order to make them a little bit more quiet and contain the heat um, so we do a lot of packaging and we realize that a lot of our experience is in packaging with energy storage you can find people that um, will manufacture the battery We'll manufacture the inverters but most of them are shoving it into an offshore container something that would be on a ship and um, packaging it and selling it that way right but the problem is that there's no way to it's really unsafe to um, uh, maintain that equipment because you have to somebody has to actually go inside but because of the way our equipment is manufactured it's all designed to have the doors open so if I had the key you'd see in here there's a whole bunch of lithium-ion batteries just like Tesla, a whole bank of them. Um, there you go. <laughs> a shot of vodka, it'll do fine. Um, so batteries are what kind of electricity? DC. Direct current, right? But everything that runs in your house is AC. So alternating current. Um, right now, believe it or not, you know, with all these wires and everything running all over the place and um, all the wind turbines and solar panels, there's absolutely no way, if everybody turned off all of their equipment, there's no way to store all that energy. So they either have to turn off, I mean, slow down all the water that's coming out of the dam or turn off all those solar panels or just let all that um, wind energy go out um, someplace else. There's no way to literally store it. Well, that's what the direction that the industry is going is how, now that everybody's putting all these solar panels on top of their roof and um, wind turbines, how do we actually store this? So this unit here can produce about one megawatt of energy, which is enough to run this whole plant um, all day long or a hospital or a university. So there's a lot of power in here, electrical power. Um, like I said, over here, it has the lithium ion batteries over here are the inverters, which basically take DC current and um, convert it back to AC. And it also steps up the voltage um, real high. And there's a reason why they do that is um, the higher the voltage, the less the losses going down the electric wire because of resistance. Okay. Um, 
because it's in a big box and we have a lot of energy in this big box, um, there's a air conditioning systems on each end to keep the big box cool. Because as it's doing all this work, it's trying to cool itself back down again. You don't want all, too much heat building up there. That's bad for the batteries or inverters. If we go around the back, you'll see our control system. Watch on in so you can see that um, panel. Um, so again, this um, this computer system was developed for our turbo machinery, but um, it was pretty easy to adapt it to um, the energy storage unit because our turbo machinery runs generators, and so we're constantly always controlling the electricity that's coming off the end of the generator. So from a control standpoint, it doesn't know the difference. This could be a generator or um, a battery set. Um, now here's the real interesting part, is what this is doing is monitoring um, the amount of energy that's coming into our plant, but it's also monitoring what the utility is selling it to us for. So um, at a certain time of day, when the sun becomes high here in California, um, all of a sudden the utility companies have more electricity on the lines than people are consuming. So they actually pay us to absorb some of that electricity off the line. Do you guys all catch that most important part? Hey. Most, yes. most of the times you're paying for electricity. Yeah. From two o'clock to four o'clock, they're paying us to absorb electricity. So that's really, it's a real um, economic advantage if you've got an energy storage unit. From two to four, you're sucking in energy, you're getting paid for it. And then um, when they when the demand people go home and start turning on their air conditioning, the lights, ovens, baking their cookies, whatever else, um, the 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 amount of power demand increases. So we push power back either into our plant and consume it that way, or um, we can push it back onto the utility and sell it again. So we get paid, and we could get we could sell it. So that's the key advantage and why um, energy storage is going to be such a huge market. Um, in the future. And for this contract, is it is it same rate of pay and sell, or is it a variable? Uh, variable. Okay. Yeah. So with wind turbines, um, during the summertime is, of course, everybody's running their air conditioning. Um, that's when the highest demand is. So with a wind turbine contract, I know more about wind turbines because my previous job, I, I went out and certified um, wind turbines. Um, in the middle of the day, they're getting paid like above 20 cents for kilowatt hour, uh, like like in the evening, mm -hmm. outside of the two to four range. Mm -hmm. um, during the winter, when there's low demand, um, they're getting paid only like 10 cents per kilowatt hour, right? So when are you gonna do all your maintenance? Winter time. The winter time. When are you gonna wanna make sure that thing is running Summer. as much as possible? Yeah. Summertime, right. So um, they, they do a lot of their heavy duty maintenance um, during the winter and uh, and uh, they try to keep those things running as much as possible during the summertime.